Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center. My name is Leah Knobel and I'm the moderator for today's briefing. It's my pleasure to introduce Frank Mora, U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. Ambassador Mora will preview the 54th General Assembly of the Organization of American States in Paraguay beginning on June 26th. A reminder that this discussion is on the record and the briefing transcript and video will be posted to our website, fpc.state.gov, later today. Today's briefing is being shared with U.S.-based foreign journalists credentialed with the Foreign Press Center and with journalists based in Latin America via the State Department's Media Hub of the Americas. This briefing will be conducted in English with Spanish interpretation available for those joining virtually. And with that, I will turn it over to Ambassador Mora for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for being here, whether in person or online. Uh, as it was mentioned next week um, uh, in Asuncion, Paraguay, uh, the OAS, the Organization of American States, will be holding its 54th uh, General Assembly from the 26th to the 28th uh, of June. Uh, the U.S. delegation would be led by uh, Deputy Secretary for Management Resources, Richard Verma. The delegation will be uh, composed of myself, as well as Assistant Secretary Brian Nichols, uh, Senior Director for the National Security Council for the Western Hemisphere, uh, Dan Erickson, and Enrique Roy, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the, Depart in the Bureau of Democracy, uh, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, the theme of the General Assembly is titled Integration and Security for Sustainable Development in the Region. There are a number of regions, the key issues that we'll be discussing, negotiating resolutions about, but I wanted to emphasize one key point. And that is that the uh, United States the, has uh, been clear in its commitment to bolstering, to strengthening this critical international organization. The OAS is the oldest multilateral forum in the world, uh, having been established since the 1890s a version of it in 1910 in the Pan-American Union, and then its current form since 1948. Uh, it is a treaty organization with a bureaucracy that is focused on four key areas. Each of these areas will be discussed at, uh, at the General Assembly in Asuncion. First, the issue of democracy and the protection, defense, and promotion of democracy. Second, human rights. There will be a, a, a large omnibus resolution that will be addressing the issue of human rights. Uh, uh, across the board, whether it is on civil political rights as well as the rights of marginalized uh, and excluded groups. Third is the issue of security. Security, as you know, is the probably the most immediate and, and challenging uh, uh, issue that the region is facing, regardless of, of what country you're in the region. And uh, many member states, many delegations will be very focused on this issue of security. And finally, uh, integral development or development is the fourth pillar, the first key issue that we'll be discussing in the, in the region. Uh, the OAS provides a, a unique and important critical platform, a multilateral platform. It's a space where collectively we can not just discuss issues, but think about how we can address them. The nature of the challenges we face today, whether it's security or democracy or development or climate change, for example, are issues that are transnational in nature. No one single country can by themselves or themselves address each of these issues alone. Uh, it requires a collective response to these transnational challenges. And that, uh, that's why I think the OAS is uniquely positioned to, uh, to address these issues on a hemispheric basis. The other thing I want to say is in terms of US priority, the United States is very focused on strengthening this institution, demonstrating its relevance, the impact that it has on its daily lives. The organization has its challenges, particularly in the resource area. And the United States is very focused on addressing these issues, the budgetary issues as some of, some of the other issues. Uh, as someone said before, if the OAS did not exist, you'd have to create it because of the nature of the challenges today. A second key priority that we will be focusing on is democracy and particularly uh, the strengthening of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Charter signed in 2001, on 9-11, 2001. And at that point, the member states, presidents and delegations from across the hemisphere made a collective commitment to not only defend,
but also to promote democracy in the region. As you know, democracy today is at risk. There has been backsliding in the rule of law. And at no point, I think, uh, critical today, it is important that we think about this particular challenge in a collective way. And the charter provides us with the, with the tools. It's an instrument that allows us to do the kind of follow-up commitment on the part of member states to address challenges to democracy and, of course, to human rights as well. And so we will have, or we'll be negotiating a resolution about how do we strengthen, continue strengthening the Inter-American Democratic Charter. There is a group, a voluntary group of member states, approximately 18 member states. The United States presides that voluntary group who has the charge of looking into ways that we can strengthening and bringing the charter, which is now over two decades uh, old, bringing the charter to address the, the challenges of today, challenges of democracy today, that did not exist in 2000. And one. There are a couple important, and there are many, but I'll mention just important um, mechanisms, tools that, that the OAS has to address issues such as democracy and human rights. One is the uh, electoral observation mission. The OAS uh, electoral observation missions, which has, I believe, sort of uh, observed about 10 elections just this year or the last year and a half, is the gold standard for electoral observation missions. Uh, the, the methodology, the legitimacy, the impartiality, the analysis that it does in observing elections across the hemisphere, to include here in the United States, is second to none. And we, the United States, and I believe the OAS member states, should commit themselves to finding ways to continuing supporting and strengthening that particular mechanism. And finally, with respect to human rights, one cannot forget the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Right. Uh, I, I also believe that the commission, the work it does in shining the light on abuses of human rights in the region of one kind or another is also second to none. The United States is a strong uh, political, financial supporter of the commission, as are many states, uh, member states of the hemisphere. And I think around these issues of democracy, around these issues of security, uh, and human rights, there is consensus within the hemisphere. As you know, the OAS is a consensus-based organization. It is difficult sometimes to find consensus, but there are some key areas in which I believe there is consensus. And the issue of human rights, the issue of security and democracy are some of the areas where I think we will find uh, strong consensus in passing resolutions. And finally, I say that we will, pro like very likely, the General Assembly will adopt a resolution on Haiti and continued support for Haiti, and particularly from not only the security dimension, but from the humanitarian situation. And then finally, a resolution on Nicaragua, making sure that we fulfill the commitment we made months ago when Nicaragua left the OAS uh, in saying that the, uh, the Nicaraguan people will not be abandoned uh, by the OAS, that we, the Permanent Council, as well as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, will continue working and ensuring that we do not forget what is going on in that country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Mora. So we'll now take some questions. Uh, for those of you in the room, please raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself and your outlet, and please speak up if you can. Uh, for journalists joining us via Zoom, please be sure your screen name includes your name, media outlet, and country. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat. We are only taking written questions today. So we'll start with any questions from journalists in the room. Go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, my name is Gustavo. I'm a freelancer right now. Two questions, if I may. First one is this, this General Assembly is going to happen right after the Venezuelan elections. Before. Before Venezuelan elections. Is there any conversation right now among the members of the um, uh, Council to talk about the potential return of Venezuela, uh, depending on the of the outcome of the election. And the second is, this uh, is the last General Assembly of the uh, current General Secretary. Um, again, any conversations about who would uh, take the lead of Luis Almagro uh, next year? Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, yes, with respect to the first question on Venezuela, there are a number of conversations that go on in the margins of the Permanent Council. Of course, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights continues to do its work uh, with respect to human rights in Venezuela. But I think in terms of 
uh, the conversations we've had, I think there is an expectation and hope that the commitments that the parties made, including uh, commitments made by Maduro and the, and, and the authorities, uh, will, will, will comply with what they agreed upon. Uh, the election is on July, July 28th, uh, so in about a month, uh, a month and a half. Um, there we have seen challenges uh, and efforts by Maduro and his authorities to, to impede the process, but it's still moving forward. Uh, I think member states are concerned and make, trying to ensure that the process moves forward despite the challenges. Uh, we will see, Gustavo, what happens uh, in a month and a half. Uh, but um, uh, we, we just hope and expect that all the parties comply with the commitments they made, particularly in the Barbados Agreement. With respect to the Secretary General elections, you're right. I think people are starting to talk about that leadership change, which will happen in the spring of next year. Um, there's only been one official candidate uh, that has presented uh, um, his candidacy, uh, the so Foreign Minister Surinam. I expect that by the end of the year, there will be other, um, uh, others that will uh, present their, their candidacy to be the next Secretary General and Assistant Secretary General. Um, we are um, having those discussions, but I guess I think it's important that, that, uh, that we wait until other member states, others who want to present their candidacy will do so by the end of the year before we had a a full-throated conversation and decision before we have to make the decision in the spring of next year. Any other questions in the room for now? Okay, we'll turn to a couple on Zoom. The first one comes from, you've answered part of this question, but there are some additional questions from Jose Rodriguez from La Prensa in Nicaragua. He asks, is a resolution on Nicaragua going to be discussed? What is the expectation of the United States before the General Assembly regarding the socio-political crisis situation in Nicaragua? Will the issue of irregular migration promoted by Nicaragua through charter flights also be addressed? So I am very confident that a very strong resolution will be adopted by the General Assembly um, on Nicaragua. Uh, I think you will see that resolution uh, soon. Uh, it makes a sort of a, a list of continued abuses and violations of the most basic political and civil rights, human rights. Um, but it is, and it urges uh, the, 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 the regime in Managua to return to respecting and complying with the commitments they've made to a number of conventions and treaties regarding human rights. Uh, and it also makes the same commitment that it's made in previous resolution, and that is that the OAS, whether the Permanent Council or uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, will not simply ignore or discard or neglect um, what is going on within the country. We will not abandon the Nicaraguan people, and we will continue shining the light on the abuses there. And I think the resolution, as you will see, and I expect uh, that it will be adopted in the General Assembly, you will see... Uh, strong language that reflects, I think, the the outrage that I think many of us feel about what is going on in that in that country. The issue of irregular migration is not uh, come out explicitly with respect to Nicaragua. Does not come out explicitly, but I should say that in the many conversations, at least certainly formal conversations, there is a strong awareness and concern about that. Um, but we are not taking any specific actions with respect to the specific issue of irregular migration in Nicaragua. Thank you. Uh, Maria, go ahead. Uh, you say that you have hope. your outlet, sorry. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm from NTN24. Ambassador, do you, you say there's hope in the Venezuela situation, but just yesterday, 10 mayors from the opposition were disqualified uh, just because they were um, supporting the candidacy of Mr. Edmundo. So is there really hope? And do you have any reaction to the fact that they disqualified these mayors? And on the other hand, um, there's the estimate is that if Maduro wins the elections, around 2 million Venezuelans more could be leaving the country. Is the U.S. ready for that? And is the OIS ready for that? Well, in terms of the second question, I don't want to speculate, so I don't want to get ahead. But I'll answer your first question. As I said, I mean, I think it's important. We are not naive about the situation in Venezuela. As I mentioned, we have seen 
the Maduro uh, take steps that are not consistent with, um, with the agreements that he made in Barbados. Uh, you mentioned the uh, rest of mayors, there's detention of uh, opposition political leaders, et cetera. Um, it was concern to us the fact that the European Union will not have observers for the elections. Uh, the expectation was that, that, that they would. Um, so yes, we are concerned. We're not naive. We're not optim. I'm not going to say we're optimistic, but we're going to continue with the international community and particularly with, uh, Venezuela's neighbors, uh, president Petro and president Lula have made comments about some of these things that we've seen in the last uh, few weeks and months. I think those are positive messages by, uh, Venezuela's neighbors. I think the OAS and its member states should continue. Uh, engaging and calling attention to whenever we see these kinds of abuses. Uh, nonetheless, we're going to keep pushing and pressuring in a positive way, pressuring. And I, when I say we, I don't mean just the United States. I think the international community should keep pushing Maduro towards uh, having a, a, a credible, uh, fair election in that country. We'll turn back to Zoom. Um, we'll take a question from Ferlin Fuentes with um, La Nacion in Costa Rica. Um, they ask, from your point of view, is this the most critical moment for Latin democracies? Short answer is yes. Um, the vulnerabilities, the, the risk that many democracies find themselves in throughout the hemisphere is of concern of great concern. We often use the phrase democratic backsliding. I think it's real. Uh, but you have to look at the data. Um, uh, we have seen whether it's Latino Barometro or LAPOP, uh, outfit at Vanderbilt University, have shown that support for democracy in the region has declined. There is high levels of disaffection. And as uh, Secretary Blinken has said on, on several occasions, uh, with respect to not just the Western Hemisphere, but democracy around the globe, is that uh, democracies need to deliver. At the end of the day, they have to be able to deliver. Uh, and at the moment, uh, that is in question, right? And so we need to work together, whether through the OAS, bilaterally in different ways, to address those issues of most concern to the citizens of the Americas. So, for example, the issue of security which is a grave concern in particular some countries. And so unless we can address, these democracies can demonstrate that we're able to address the issue of security, address the issue uh, of inequality, the address the issue of even climate change, then democracy will continue to be at risk. And so uh, uh, the administration, I think, is very committed to focusing on those areas not because those areas are just critical and it's important we deal to security, but that it has a negative effect on democracy if they are allowed to persist. So uh, uh, whether it is at the OAS or other mechanisms, but I think the OAS provides a unique opportunity and platform if we're committed to that organization to address these issues in a collective way. Great. Our next question comes from Toshia Nakamura. Um, He's with the Mainichi newspapers in Japan. Regarding presidential elections of Venezuela, does the OAS plan to send election monitoring team? No, election. because uh, Maduro has uh, refused. Uh, uh, the, the, what I said is, uh, what I said before is the gold standard um, at the OAS, which is the Electro Observation Mission. But for uh, the OAS electro observation missions to be um, observing elections, they need to be invited by the government that is having the elections. And no, Maduro has not invited the OAS to observe the elections. Yes. I'm going to take um, a submitted advanced question from Mariano Beldic with El Cronista in Argentina. They ask, I would like to ask your opinion about Argentina's role in the inter-American scenario. If you have noticed any change in its foreign policy and its approach to the region from the U.S. point of view since the beginning of Malay's administration, Malay's administration. Well, I think uh, initially, I think that the recognition uh, on the part of the Malay government 
uh, about the dangers of democracy in the region, I think is important. And I think we share that, that concern. Um, and I think we look forward to working within the inter-American system, within the OAS, as we, for example, build and strengthen the inter-American charter and all the other tools that we have to support democracy and human rights at the OAS, that Argentina will play a leadership role on, on these issues. And we certainly, the United States, would, would very much um, welcome that. Second, I, I have no reason to believe, and for what I've seen so far, they are very engaged and committed to the OAS. Uh, they are not running away from the S. In fact, they are very engaged in the OAS. We expect them to be very involved on all these negotiations that are ongoing in, uh, at the OAS. Um, and so uh, we also welcome that uh, because, as I said, we all share, I think, a hope um, an interest in strengthening the inter-American system and particularly the, the OAS. So uh, we, we, we very much um, uh, enjoy that. So in the end, I think I haven't seen on these broader issues any, any significant change other than I think it's important to say they're, they've demonstrated their commitment to, to work with and partner not only with the United States but with others to ensure that the OAS remains faithful in commitment committed to, to strengthening democracy in the region. So we'll take a couple more questions from Zoom. Uh, the next one comes from Daniel Cohen. He's with TN23 in Guatemala. They ask, in Guatemala, attacks on the democratic system by the public ministry continue. In a court, doubts were raised about the electoral results that led to Bernardo Arevalo to win the presidency. What opinion do you have about this? If I understand the question correctly, I, you know, I think that the Electro Observation, the OAS Electro Observation mission, uh, did a uh, very uh, extraordinary job, as it does everywhere else. Um, it demonstrated that the elections were free and fair, and that in a second round, Bernardo Revelo won um, the election by a significant margin. Uh, and uh, I think. Uh, the results, uh, the early results demonstrated, uh, I think, a, a consistency with, with the OAS um, findings. Um, I think uh, I take this opportunity to um, highlight that Guatemala is a test case, an example of where when we work together using the Inter-American Democratic Charter and other tools at the, at the OAS, uh, how the OAS played a secondary but a critical role in ensuring not just that there was a free and fair election in Guatemala, but that Bernardo Arevalo became president in January of, of this year. Uh, the president Arevalo has uh, recognized the critical effort uh, that the OAS and role that the OAS played in ensuring that the process went as smooth as possible, at least to ensuring that he uh, was inaugurated in January of this year. Uh, the OAS will remain engaged. Um, there will be, um, uh, President Revelo may came to the OAS and made a request, a request that the OAS send an observer mission, uh, a judicial observer mission to, the OAS, to Guatemala to observe a three or four month process or selection process of members of the Supreme Court and of the Appeals Court. Uh, that mission will arrive uh, by the end of this month and will continue doing its work. Uh, another example of how the OAS can ensure that there uh, remains a sort of, the, the, where the OAS can shine the light on both the processes at the request of the Guatemalan uh, government. So I look forward to the work of this particular, in some ways, unique mission that will be in Guatemala for the next three or four months during the selection process of uh, judicial uh, representatives. Thanks. We'll take one final question from Zoom. We'll go back to Ferlin Fuentes. He has another question. Um, President Rodrigo Chavez said a week ago that Costa Rica is a, quote, perfect dictatorship, end quote, when asked about the rule of law in his country. What is your opinion of his government's current work to strengthen democracy? Well, I'm not going to comment on, on President Chavez's, but I think uh, Ch uh, Costa Rica is and has been and remains a, a shining example 
of a consolidated democracy, that despite the challenges that we all face, for example, on security, it remains uh, institutionally a, a strong uh, democracy that respects human rights, that respects the rule of law, that respects the separation of powers. And uh, that long tradition um, of Costa Rica, I think, is, is something that we all admire and respect. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, and uh, I have no reason to believe that, that Costa Rican democracy is in any way in danger. It, it has the same challenges we all face, no, no doubt about that. But it is a resilient democracy. Uh, and it will remain so, I believe. Great, thank you. This concludes the Q&A portion of our briefing. Ambassador, do you have any final words you'd like to share? Other than I hope to see you all in Asuncion. I want to give a special thanks again to Ambassador Mora for sharing his time with us today and to those of you who have joined us in person and online. Thank you. This concludes our briefing. Thank you.